Hello and welcome to Dr. Bristle here and in my last video I discussed with you the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. Now, now there's two different forms of, of of actually carrying out this light dependent stage because there's, there's two different sort of almost flows of, uh, of like things. Um, it's, it's quite hard to explain really actually this one. Um, so you have photosystem 2 and you have photosystem 1 as I've drawn out last time with the electron carriers and stuff. Um, but this time I'd like you to know like the individual stages of, of electron movement almost. Because what basically what happens is the flow of electrons from photosystem two to photosystem one and then it goes like to the to the top of the ATP synthase channel where NADP is reduced. But you have these two processes called cyclic and non cyclic. Photo, phos, phori, relation. Now, I wouldn't panic. Cyclic and non-cyclic photophosphorylation are actually very simple. It's just it's hard to explain what they actually are because what happens is um, because light can strike photosystem two and light can strike photosystem one. What happens if photosystem one is known as cyclic photophosphorylation but both photosystem 2 and photosystem 1 can take part in something called non-cyclic photophosphorylation now what happens in cyclic phosphorylation is is that when light strikes this this photosystem 1 that the electrons are passed on to the electron carriers in order to reach this NADP but it, it never actually gets there because what happens is the electrons they move but up but then they move straight back to photosystem one. Now, now you may think, well, that's completely that's completely pointless. Like supposing the electron carrier gets the electrons, but it, it's never used to actually achieve anything. But the actual what it actually achieves is because these electrons they sort of move up onto these electron carriers and then back again. This this movement is going to generate some energy. So there's some generation of ATP with a cyclic um, generation of ATP. But because it's moving up here onto this bit and then back and not actually reaching this NADP, it can't reduce it, which means that there's no generation of reduced NADP. So I'll write that. No generation of R NADP, I'll write instead of reduced NADP, because you know what that is. Okay, so that's basically what happens with cyclic. Now, now what happens in non cyclic? Is, is the electrons from this are transported from here like, like, by the way this is a, a, a phospholipid bilayer in case you was wondering where these are um, I described in my last video exactly where they are so if you want to know that then I'd advise you to watch that video quickly um, but anyway that, these are, are just the, the, hydro, the, hydrophi the hydrophilic heads sorry, and the hydrophobic tails which are inside the phospholipid bilayer okay so Non-cyclic photophosphorylation involves um, it's called non-cyclic because um, the the, um, the the transfer of electrons does not just go back like photosystem one the, the electrons are passed onto these electron carriers and it comes straight back so that's why it's almost like a cycle but with non-cyclic it goes the electrons go onto the NADP and are used to reduce it so that's not not essentially a cycle if that makes sense so that that's the main difference. And uh, photosystem one and two is involved in non-cyclic so photophosphorylation, as I said before, um, and, and that's pretty much all you need to know. I mean, there's not not a great deal to learn about, and that's why it's sort of quite difficult to understand, get your head round, because there isn't actually much information that you actually need to remember. Um, the, the other thing is that cyclic phosphorylation, which involves photosystem one, you may think, well, if it generates a bit of a, a bit of ATP, sorry, where is this ATP going to be used? Well, it's going to be used in the guard cells because you have these cells, guard cells, and what they do is, is, is they can open and close the, the stomata, basically, which, which are like the holes. So basically, if you, if you have holes like on the underside of a leaf, that there's certain gases that are required for photosynthesis to take place, such as carbon dioxide, and there's water also, which is needed to take place, but water actually comes from the roots and up the stem, so I'm not going to discuss that too much. But in order to get this 
this carbon dioxide in and to let the oxygen that's formed from like, this whole process of photosynthesis out, you need to, to control the turgidity, it's called, which is essentially the amount, the this sort of puffiness almost of the of the guard cells, and that sounds funny, but basically, basically, supposing these are turgid, it means they're they're puffed out and, and they're almost sort of bloated with water, is a is a more technical term. So basically, when once they're bloated, this gas exchange can't take place. Carbon dioxide can't come in, and oxygen can't come out. But in order to do this, the potential inside these guard cells need needs to be lowered significantly so that water actually flows into them to make them puffy. So in order to do this. The concentration of, of K plus ions, otherwise known as potassium ions, has to build up inside these guard cells. And you may think, well, if the concentration is higher inside, surely water won't flow into it. It will flow out of it. Well, th this is where the, uh, this whole idea of water potential comes in. That we're going to introduce to you now. So you have water, which, which on the water potential scale is zero. But then you have solutes, which are things that dissolve in water, that have a negative water potential. So what this means is these... Although they're positive ions because they've lost their electron, they have a negative potential, which means that the water has a higher potential, because zero is higher than a negative number, um, which means that water actually flows into these cells to puff them out. That's a hard concept to get your head around, so I'll just sort of give you a minute to, to sort of understand that while I'm sort of moving on to my next video. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope it enlightens you a bit more about cyclic and non-cyclic photophosphorylation and what it actually is. I know it's and I struggle to sort of explain so, so almost like a definition of it, but photo just means um, light, using light, phosphorylation is the addition of, uh, of like phosphate things, so it's essentially making ATP, um, like using light and it's essentially making ATP using light, but it's, 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 not, it's, it's quite a difficult thing to define because that, cause one of them is just a cycle, which is why it's called cyclic, and the other one is not a cycle, so it's called non-cyclic. But in terms of how this fits into the light, light dependent and light independent stage, it is quite a difficult thing to define. So, so that's the reason why I've sort of spent quite a while just going over what it is, so that you understand sort of how how it fits in and how it relates to the light dependent stage. So, I hope this video has been helpful for that, and hope you understand a bit more about potentials and how they work. See you in the next video.